The topic of this talk will be bringing Nazis to trial. The first thing one needs to say is that uh, in a democracy, in uh, a true, uh, a, a fair trial, means that uh, the defendant is uh, told what the case against him or her is, uh, is shown the documentation or the sources which are, uh, on which the allegations are based, is given the time to prepare a defense uh, and uh, sets forth a defense trying to either refute the story or else explain something else, has a different explanation for what happened, or, or to explain that, that, that the defendant was, wasn't there at all, or whatever. That's what the saying of, what, what, what the term having their day in the court means. It means that the defendant is given a fair hearing. Uh, it must be said that in the uh, mid-1943-44, as the Allied powers knew that they were going to win the war but hadn't yet won it, and they were discussing what would be done to the uh, Nazi leaders and others after the war, it was not clear that they would be given a free trial. Churchill uh, famously advocated at one point, lining up 10,000 top Nazis and shooting them. Uh, the Americans, of course, were horrified by that idea, and it never happened, and I'm not certain that the British ever would have done something like that, uh, but it, as the war was still going, they were certainly willing to, to, uh, to consider the idea. The Soviets uh, were, of course, at, at all times willing to line up 10,000 Nazis and shoot them, or hang them better, uh, and uh, to a large extent, the Soviet, and it, the Soviet Union and its satellite uh, uh, states that began to be formed after World War II, to a, certain, to a considerable extent indeed did that. There were many thousands of, uh, of, of Nazis who were given at the most a, a semblance of a day in their court, uh, which a trial that took half an hour or took a day and a half, and then they were strung up and hung. Uh, however, the, uh, the, the Americans, and <coughs> eventually joined by the British uh, and also the French, and then eventually the Soviets joined also in the, uh, in the understanding that after, after World War II there had to be, uh, there had to be a real trial uh, with, uh, with, uh, with the defendants given a day in the court. Now the, uh, the essence of having a day in, in a court means that, you, the, that, the, that the prosecution has to make a serious case. How do you make a serious case against Nazi war criminals? Well, in the case of, uh, the, of, of Nazis who were uh, who were indicted on counts of direct murder, somebody who ran a concentration camp, or somebody who was in the Einsatzgruppen and was shooting people, uh, the case is not all that hard to make. You find witnesses who can attest to the actions that happened and the fact that the defendant was participating. And it's maybe not that simple, but that's roughly, roughly how it's done. Uh, in the case of the top leaders, uh, the top leaders, uh, it was, it was an easier case. There was endless amount of documentation of the, of the things that they were saying that needed to be done. So that wasn't that hard to do either. But in the case of the bureaucrats, and the, uh, of which there were tens of thousands of people who along the way participated in, and sometimes crucial participation in the murder of the, of the Jews and, and other crimes against humanity committed by the Nazis, uh, this was not so easy to do. You had to have either eyewitness testimony. In the case of bureaucrats of death, eyewitness testimony would not be particularly easy to come by since their crime consisted not of being in the field and shooting people, but rather sitting behind desks and organizing the conditions in which people would be deported their deaths and gassed. So what eyewitnesses would you bring? At the most, you can bring other equally uh, 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 involved uh, Nazis who will, who will testify against their superiors, perhaps. The most important thing to bring would be documentation. And it has to be remembered that as the World War ended, nobody had the documentation. Nobody understood the outlines of the story that had happened, and there was no way they could have. It was too immediate. Uh, and so uh, in the case of the Nuremberg trials, the most famous ones, which were in 1946, so about a year after the war, uh, there were teams of, uh, there, were, there were teams of mostly men, uh, who scoured the Nazi uh, offices and collected documents in order to try and put piece together a piece of, of the, a picture of what was happening. You have to remember the people who were doing this were, either they were lawyers serving in the West, in the Allied armies, or else they were politicians above them putting pressure on, you know, do this job quickly because we, the public demands and we have to, we have, to have these trials as quickly and as effectively as possible. Uh, 
They were not historians, and they were certainly not archivists, which means that uh, in, the, uh, in, in, the, in the initial stage of, 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 the, of the Nuremberg trials, uh, they did something which historians and archivists would never have allowed them to do, but the historians and the archivists weren't asked. They simply collected documents, distached, disengaged them, they detached them from whatever files they found them in, and they made a new collection called the Nuremberg documents. And uh, the historians don't like this because historians like to see documents in the file, in the original file they came from, so that you know not only who wrote what, on what date, but in what context it's connected. Why was that letter written from one person to another, and so on and so forth. Uh, this uh, we don't have in the case of the Nuremberg documents. So the Nuremberg documents were many, many thousands of documents that were torn from their context, collected in one collection, and laid out in a way that was supposed to, to, uh, to, to tell the story of what had happened. Uh, uh, the story that they were looking at at the Nuremberg trials was not the murder of the Jews. The story they were looking at at the Nuremberg trials was first and foremost the, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the aggression, German aggression which, which, which had unleashed World War II and uh, some of the more uh, obvious crimes. But the Holocaust was not, a, uh, was not something that anybody was being tried for at Nuremberg. The specific policy of murdering the Jews. This was not, this was not something that anybody was tried for at Nuremberg. When the Israeli prosecution uh, was handed the file in 1960, uh, the Mossad had, had, had kidnapped Eichmann in Argentina and brought him to Israel to be tried. Therefore, the, uh, the prosecutors here in Israel uh, did not have a clear path forward. There, there, weren't, there weren't precedents for such things. So, of course, the first thing that they did is to set up a small team of people. Some, by some of this t stage already did have a certain amount of historical training. And they were supposed to uh, collect the documents. The first thing they went, of course, is they looked at the documentation from uh, the Nuremberg trials, but this time looking through the documentation with an eye towards uh, activities that Eichmann had, uh, w was specifically engaged in. But uh, secondly, they made the decision to bring uh, many um, Holocaust survivors who would testify to the story of the Holocaust. And here you get the rather strange result that most of the Eichmann trial did not deal directly with Eichmann itself, uh, himself. Uh, most of the trial dealt with the describing the Holocaust, of which Eichmann had been an important part. Eichmann ultimately was convicted on the paper trail, on the documents, of which there was no dearth of documents proving Eichmann's position in it. Uh, but the, uh, that, was, that was not the main, the, the main effect of the trial. The main effect of the trial was these Holocaust survivors telling their stories, which were actually legally not particularly relevant because most of them, not all of them, but most of them had never seen Eichmann and didn't know, they had never encountered him during the war, and they could not testify to what he specifically had done. So you had this, the, 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 the educational aspect of the trial in which the, uh, in, in which, uh, the Israelis, and to a certain extent a lot of other people outside of Israel were, were listening, horrified to these concentrated stories about the Holocaust, and you had the fact that the man had to be convicted and hanged based on documents. The Eichmann trial in 1961 was one of the uh, uh, motivations for the main uh, process of bringing Nazi uh, criminals to trial, which happened in Germany, mostly in West Germany, the Federal Republic, after 1961, although it had begun slightly before then. Uh, from the early 1960s until about the early, middle, mid-1970s, the German prosecution uh, tried to bring tens of thousands of German war criminals to trial. However, they had a number of problems. One of the problems that the German prosecutors had in the 1960s and 1970s was the statute, statute of limitation uh, said that uh, it's more than 15 years, eventually more than 20 years after the Holocaust, the only crime for which an individual could still be put on trial that many years after the event was first degree murder. And the first degree murder, in order to be proven, had to include the uh, proving beyond any reasonable doubt, not only that the person did something, but also that they, they, they did it with the intention to cause harm, or in this case, that they did it in the intent with the, that they participated in the murder of the Jews in, with the intention of participating in the murder of the Jews. So that was, that was a serious problem, uh, because you had to find documentation not only that said that such and such an officer signed such and such a decree, but that such and such an officer was an anti-Semite or was aware of what was going on and agreed with it. So that was, that was, that was one problem. There's another technical problem, that was that Germany is divided. It's a federal, it's a federal country, and therefore uh, different Germans in different uh, parts of the country are under the jurisdiction of different courts. Uh, 
And all of the crimes that we're talking about had not, or most of the crimes we're talking about, hadn't taken place in Germany at all. They had taken place uh, in the rest of Europe. And so the decision was made in the early 1960s in Germany that on this, uh, on this matter, which was uh, not a local matter, the prosecutions from all over Germany would participate in, uh, uh, would collaborate. They had set up a special office at a place called Ludwigsburg near, near, near Stuttgart, where uh, the different uh, prosecutions would collaborate. They would help one another with collecting documentation. They would help one another with uh, collecting witnesses. They would make long lists of people who might have been bu bureaucrats in a certain office at a certain date and find out where they lived in the mid-1960s and then interrogate them or call them in to be, to, to, to be interviewed and figure out more names. There was a lot of co cooperation with the police in the state of Israel, seeing if there was perhaps, uh, if there were survivors here. Uh, this created a tremendous uh, um, impediment towards sm smooth uh, operation. On the other hand, it also created mountains of documentation, which uh, are perhaps the major significance of this whole operation, because sadly, the German courts did not cooperate. Uh, the number of Germans who were uh, investigated with an eye towards bringing them to trial was upwards of 70,000, maybe more than 100,000, depending how you define it. So many tens of thousands of German men who had been, uh, uh, had been actors in the, in the Holocaust who were interrogated by the prosecution who would have been willing to put them to trial if they found enough about them. The courts, in most cases, threw out the case, threw out the cases before they even began or else very early on. Only about 7,000 of these, more than 70,000, were ultimately put on trial. And out of the 7,000, only about 700 were convicted. So it's a minuscule number. The significance on, on that level, the, 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 on, on that level, these effort, the efforts of the German prosecution for all of the effort they put into it were unsuccessful. However, the long-term significance of what they did was that in uh, their, uh, this process of collecting documentation and passing it from one to another and trying to f find out who else had been in which office on which day and what else they could say and so on and so forth, created mountains of documentation which enabled the historians to know in minutiae detail things about Nazi Germany which, had it not been for these illegal efforts, we would not have known. And I'll give one example just as a uh, final illustration because I think it's very important. Uh, many of the Nazi uh, defendants, if they were brought to trial in those unusual cases, used the line of defense that they had merely been following orders. And uh, by the time the German prosecution had these mountains of documentation, and they could show, since they had had to prove that the men had been doing what they'd been doing with the intention and with, an, with agreement, then they could show that not only did most of these men believe in what they were doing, but they could also show that there was no documentation, nobody had seen any documentation from the time of the, of the Holocaust, when anybody was threatened uh, that they had to do what they had to do, otherwise they would be punishment. That otherwise they would be punished. It, there was no such documentation. So the second line of defense then brought by, uh, by canny lawyers uh, defending Nazi uh, war criminals was, well, uh, they didn't act out of duress in the direct meaning. They thought that if they disobeyed orders, then they would be punished. And so the prosecutions then went looking through, the, sifting through these masses of documents and again found no indication whatsoever that anybody ever was punished. And since they had such large amounts of documentation, every now and then they could find people who indeed said, this is as far as I'm willing to go, I'm not going to go any further, and nothing, nothing ever happened to them. So that by sometime in the mid-1970s, in those cases where the courts were dealing with these, with these cases, the courts had not only systematically thrown out every single uh, uh, line of defense that I had to do what I was doing because I was following orders, but the courts were also systematically and consistently refusing to accept the line of defense that although I didn't, nobody threatened me directly, I thought I would have had been punished uh, had, uh, had I, had I, had I uh, not carried out orders, and the courts did not accept this, and this is uh, a, the result of this um, painstaking detail collecting of uh, enormous amounts of, of documentation and, uh, and testimony which enabled the uh, prosecution to convince the courts that these two lines of defense were historically worthless.